You know what I love? I love that we, have a, we serve a speaking God and that um, I believe and I'm confident that every single one of us has already heard from God and He's spoken to us. But I also love and I believe with my whole heart that God still wants to speak this morning. Yeah. Not just to maybe the, the, a couple of people, but I believe this morning God's Word is going to speak and minister to every single one of us. Do you believe that? Yeah. Are you expectant? I know I am and I'm so like... I can't even tell you how honoured I feel to be here. I've always wanted to come to worship you. And I was driving here this morning going, how on earth do I get to be here and get the privilege of speaking God's word? I love this house. I love this church. I want to honour Pastor Bill and Benny. They are incredible pastors. This is an incredible church. And I also want to take a moment to honour Brian and Jen, who are just some of the finest people on the planet. Yes, come on. I'm sure Jen is somewhere with little Ryder watching and listening on and we just love your family and um, it's ridiculous. I'm like, um, I shouldn't admit this, but I'm like one of the biggest Bethel fans you would ever meet. And um, so I try and play it cool when I'm around Brian and Jen, you know, so I don't get too overwhelmed. But they, when they don't look, I just snap selfies and post them and stuff like that and just love them to death and love everything that they're doing. And uh, it's great. So why don't we pray, hey? Lord Jesus, we just thank you that your presence is here. And we just want to say thank you. (laughs) Thank you for who you are, for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you for what you have planned to come for every single life. And I pray that as we gather around your word, Lord God, I know that your word will transform our lives. And we thank you for that. And if you believe it, would you say amen? Amen. 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 So, you know, I've got the uh, incredible privilege of being married to the most beautiful woman in the world. Her name is Lauren. And she is unfortunately back in Sydney, Australia at the moment where I live. And we've got three beautiful children, uh, Indy, who is seven, Sailor, she is four, and Jones, a little boy, is uh, 20 months old. And it is just the greatest privilege to, to be Lauren's husband and my, my kid's parent, or oh, parent, father, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, I also get the privilege of travelling with Hillsong United. I've been on staff at Hillsong Church for over 12 years now, and I've been going to Hillsong Church since I was four years old. So, you know, I grew up in the church, and I love it, and I'm all about the church and building God's house. And, you know, uh, having the privilege of traveling for so many years, I was, I remember one of the first times we ever went to New Zealand, which is another state of Australia. Is there any Kiwis in this? No, I'm just kidding. We love New Zealand, except for when they play us in rugby, because we can't beat them ever. Um, But so I had the most embarrassing moment of my whole entire life. Has anyone had an embarrassing moment? Do you want to hear my most embarrassing moment that I've ever had? What's wrong with you sick people? You want to laugh at my... Embar- no, all right, I'll tell you, only because you asked. But we're in New Zealand and I was travelling with Hillsong United like I get to do and I was really excited. It was like a conference. It was kind of like a big warehouse like this. It was like an aeroplane hangar. It was filled with about 5,000 people and I was really excited because I walked up on the stage and as part of the staging and the props, they had these skateboard ramps, like a quarter pipe. And I just thought, you know what? I got so excited because I don't know what it is about when it comes to praising God, but I tend to get really excited and just dance and go absolutely crazy. I don't know, maybe it's because I've just experienced a little bit of how much He loves us. And so I just get, I get really excited. I walked on the stage, I saw these skateboard ramps. They were kind of everywhere. And I thought, they've put these here just for me. <laughs> they hadn't, but that's just how my amazing brain works. So anyway, we start the first praise song and I start dancing like crazy. I see one of the skateboard ramps. So I run as fast as I can. I run up it, I jump. I, I put my hands as far and high as I can. I kick my legs. I land and I keep running around. And all of a sudden, there's a breeze in between my legs that wasn't there when I walked up on stage. <laughs> and lo and behold, I looked down and I just didn't like have a little tear in my jeans. I'd ripped my jeans from my crutch all the way to my knee. <laughs> like it was just ripped and my beautiful white thigh was out for the whole world to see. And I was, it was the most embarrassing moment of my whole life. And I kind of looked down, I look up and you know, the golden rule is you should never leave stage in the middle of leading worship. But, you know, I've been to, you know, we got a Hillsong College in Sydney, Australia. I've been to Bible College, but they never taught me what to do when you rip your jeans on stage. And so I don't know what to do. And I was so embarrassed and I was supposed to keep praising God, but I kind of looked down and I couldn't handle it. I walked off stage. I was just too embarrassed. I couldn't go on. And I get off stage and we have a guy who's been traveling with us forever, Webby. He's our, our road manager. And he kind of he looks at me and he goes, what are you doing? You're supposed to be on stage. And I said, mate, I've, look at this. I cannot go back on there. It's too embarrassing. He's like, come on, go up there. You can keep praising God. I'm like, I, I just can't do it. And he goes, wait, I've got an idea. 
He reaches almost from like nowhere and he pulls forward some gaff tape. Everyone know gaff tape? <laughs> gaff tape will fix a multitude of sins. And um, so anyway, he starts to operate on my leg. He's literally doing like stripes down and wrapping around, patting it and going, all right, you're good to go. And I was like, oh, so embarrassing. I can't. He's like, I made a decision that day. I was going to keep praising God. So I got back, stood in the position that I was supposed to be. And it was right as the kind of the first slow song kind of was starting and, and, the, and the keyboard just held a really nice pad of a note. It's like you could feel the presence of God was coming in nice and thick. And I was standing there assuming the worship position, but not really worshiping, just thinking about how embarrassed and insecure I was at that moment. And, you know, as I was there pretending to worship, but just trying to like stand there with everything that I could, my mind started playing tricks on me. I don't know if anyone else, sometimes you get your mind, plays tricks on you. And I start to imagine... Again, that I can feel a breeze in between my legs and I'm going, JD, no, just focus on Jesus. Keep worshipping. You can push through this. You can keep praising God. And I'm just imagining that I can feel this breeze and then my mind just goes to a whole nother level and it's like I can imagine people are laughing at me. And again, I'm just trying to shut out those voices and and press through. But lo and behold, I open my eyes and there's about 30 people that are standing right in front of me. They start to laugh out out loud. And I'm like, and then I look down, my mind wasn't playing tricks on me. It had been that, it was that cheap gaff tape, you know, like that doesn't stick and it had come undone. And then again, my whole leg is out there for the world to see. And I'm I'm looking down at them and and they're starting to laugh. And it's like the people were, the laughter was starting to build. And Jolie Houston was leading that first song. And he, I guess he hears the laughter. He looks over at me. He looks down and sees that I've got the biggest rip in my jeans. He laughs out loud through the microphone which goes through the whole PA system and all of a sudden you've got thousands of people laughing at me and I'm standing there like this so embarrassed. I look at Joel, I look at my leg, I look at the crowd, I drop my head, I walked off stage again, I just couldn't do it. Lo and behold, I get to Webby, our faithful tour manager who's side of stage, he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I just can't keep praising God today, I can't do it. He's like, you've got to. I'm like, I can't, I'm done. And he goes, wait, I've got an idea. I'm like... What this time? And this is the honest truth. He walks into the crowd, finds a complete stranger, looks them up and down and, sa- and brings them back and says, hey, this guy's going to let you wear his jeans. <laughs> I was like, you know what? I made a decision that nothing was going to stop me from praising God. So we go back into our little dressing room. We kind of introduce myself. He gives me his name. I sa- and then he gives me his jeans. And what you've got to understand is um, this guy had the biggest, bright, blue baggiest jeans you've ever seen and I went from wearing skinny black jeans which was the moral of the story they were too tight and they ripped to wearing these massive honestly the baggiest brightest blue jeans you've ever seen so I put on my belt as tight as I can and I walked back on the stage and I'm here to testify nothing was going to stop me from praising God that morning and I think that's worth the round of applause because it was the most embarrassing moment of my life and just as a side note that I think is pretty funny so for the whole like hour and a half worship time that we had there was a complete stranger sitting in his undies in our dressing room it's it's pretty crazy but you know what it's a funny story and it was it was the most embarrassing moment of my life but I think life sometimes has a way of ripping our pants so to speak you know what I mean you know things can come our way that will cause us to not want to praise God but just because it does it doesn't mean that we should ever stop praising God amen and I want to talk this morning really briefly with a few minutes I have the power if we can live lives of relentless praise because there is power in praise. Amen. I said there is power in praise. Amen. Amen. I believe if we can be the kind of people who can be unstoppable in our praise to the Lord Jesus Christ, then I believe that what God can do with our lives is beyond what we could ever think, dream or imagine. And I want to read this story that you may have heard. It's, it's quite a well-known story and I love it. I think it's one of the greatest examples of a couple of guys who were relentless in their praise. And this story is found in Acts chapter 16. Verse 22 says, The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. The jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. Anyone agree they're having a pretty bad day so far? (laughs) No, just me? (laughs) <laughs> and then it says, verse 25, this is the craziest thing. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake. The foundation of the prison was shaken 
and all the prisoners' doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. You know, this is an incredible story because Paul and Silas, I don't believe, woke up that morning knowing exactly how bad their day was going to end up. It says that a crowd comes and attacks them. It says they are, like the magistrates ordered them to be stripped. That, you could stop right there and that is the worst day of my life. I don't know about you, but I don't want to get attacked and then stripped and be naked. But then it gets worse. They're beaten and the Bible says they didn't just get a, they copped, you know, a normal beating. They got severely flogged. Then they're thrown in prison, in prison into the inner cell. So there's no way they're getting out. And even it says their feet and their arms, they're fastened in stocks. Like they can't eat, they can't move. And then it's midnight. Picture this day that they've had. And Paul and Silas, it's, it's midnight. They would have been, had cuts and bruises, broken bones, who knows? And it's midnight. I don't know about you, but any, at the best of times when it's midnight, usually the first thing I wanted, don't want to do is to praise God. But they've had this day and it's midnight. And it says Paul and Silas began to pray and sing hymns and praise God. And as a result of their praise, the, the Bible says that suddenly an earthquake comes across and that not only their chains are broken, but every single person around them, their chains are broken as well. You know, there is power in our praise. I love this conference has been marked with the word magnify. And I believe that if we can learn from Paul and Silas, if we can understand the power we have in praising God, especially when we don't feel like it, especially when it doesn't make sense, then I believe that on the other side of our praise is the freedom that God has, not just for us, but for everyone around us. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so I want to kind of share a few, a few things that really from my journey of, of praising God that I believe we can apply into our lives to become these people of relentless praise and as a result experience the freedom, experience chains being broken, not only in our lives, but I love the power of our praise will break chains of people around us. Amen. Amen. So the first thing, if we're going to live these lives of relentless praise, is we need to concentrate on what we have. You know, I think about Paul and Silas. They didn't have much, but they had their faith and they had their voice. And it turns out that that was more than enough. And I think there's something about our lives that's so easy to, you know, you know there's that principle, the grass is greener on the other side. The truth is the grass isn't greener on the other side. The grass is greener where we water it. But we can go through our whole lives wanting what we don't have and waiting for someday, one day. But if we understand that, you know, we can just concentrate on what we actually have and understand that what we have is more than enough. You know, there's a scripture that I absolutely love. It's found in 1 Corinthians 4, 8, and it's in the message. And it says, what's the point of all this comparing and competing? Listen to this bit. You already have all you need. You already have more access to God than you can handle. Everyone repeat after me. Say, I have all that I need. Say, I have more than I need. You know, I think this is so powerful because there's a really fine difference between what we need and what we want. And I have no issue with wanting fast cars, aeroplanes, boats, whatever it is that you want. I think that's great. We should, we should want things. But as long as it comes from a place of understanding that we don't need it. Come, as long as it comes from a place where we understand that you know, like the Word of God teaches us that we actually have all that we need. We have more than we need. We have more access to God than we can handle. You know, a couple of chapters later in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17, and I honestly believe if nothing else, please listen to this scripture in the message translation. I love, I love this language and I believe that this is going to speak to people right now in this moment. It says in 1 Corinthians 7, 17, don't be wishing you were someplace else or with someone else. Where you are right now is God's place for you. Live and obey and love right there. You know, again, I, I don't know what your textbooks were like, you know, wherever you come from, whatever school you went to, but I remember my maths, mathematics textbook, I'd have to take home to do homework. It would have all the, the, the problems and, and questions that I have to solve in the front. And if you turn the book upside down and back to front, they had the answers. Did anyone have those kind of textbooks when you were in school? And none of us ever just went straight to the back for the answer, did we? No, just maybe once or twice. Hey, don't judge me. I'm confessing here. We're in church. Maybe once or twice I did it. No. I love, what I love about the Bible is you don't necessarily have to turn, like search. The answer is for this, um, the way that we're called to live is in the very verse. It says, don't be wishing you were someplace else or with someone else. Where you are right now is God's place for you. And, and here's the answer. Here's the key of how we actually access and live it out. It says we just need to live and obey and love God right there. 
You know, again, I believe, you know, the Word of God instructs us and teaches us to have a dream and a vision and incredible plan for your life. But actually, the Word of God teaches us that whatever it is that we could think that God's dreams and plans and purposes for our life are beyond what we could actually imagine. So again, don't get me wrong, because I believe we should aspire to, to, to be somewhere greater and believe that the next season is going to be greater than the one we're in. But I believe the key, if we're actually going to access that, and this is the way we can praise God in any season or any situation. If we understand that where we are right now, that God has called us to this season. God has called us to be where we are. And if we want to um, move on to the next season that God has for our life, I believe we need to live like the Bible teaches us and obey and love God and people right there where we're at. And that is the way that God is going to open up the doors for the next season that He has over your life. And so I want to encourage you today. And if we're going to live these kind of lives of praise like Paul and Silas did and experience what I believe, the freedom, the kind of chain-breaking freedom that God has, not just for us, but the people around us. We need to concentrate on what we have and understand that the season that we're in, that God has given us more than we'll ever need and we can just trust Him and concentrate on what we have and we have more than enough to praise God in this season. Amen. Do you believe it? Amen. Amen. The second thing, if we're going to live these lives of praise is we've got to understand and I love worship this morning and I feel like God was just speaking through and confirming, at least for me, what He's wanting to say today over and over. So we've got to understand that praise isn't based on how we feel. It was never, we were never designed to praise God based on our feelings. Because I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm reading a little bit in between the lines, which is, you know, dangerous territory with the Word of God. But I'm just going to, I've got a theory. I'm going to throw it out there. It's, I can't back it up, but, you know, this is my theory, that at midnight, after Paul and Silas had been severely flogged, stripped of their clothes, their feet are in stocks and it's midnight, I'm going to just go out there and say they didn't necessarily, the first thing they did was feel like praising God. Does anyone agree with my theory? I know it's out. I'm kidding. It's Australian sarcasm. They definitely wouldn't have felt like praising God in that moment. But they made a decision that they weren't going to praise God based on how they feel. And I believe it's an incredible lesson for us to learn. And I remember the first time I feel like God started revealing this revelation to me is, I was back home in Sydney, Australia, years and years ago in a worship service. And I remember, because who loves, like this morning, the, the presence of God was thick. We could have got a chainsaw and just cut through it. It was just unbelievable. I love the tangible presence of God when we can feel God. You know, who felt that this morning? It's such an, His presence is incredible. I love that there's the fullness of joy in His presence, that there's peace, that there's comfort. And I love all that kind of stuff. And I remember, you know, coming to church one Sunday, just ready to, for God to overwhelm me with, with feelings, with warm and fuzzies and, you know, goosebumps on my arms. So first song started, I lifted up my hands. I kind of had this attitude of, all right, dump it, bring it on. I want to feel good. <laughs> I'm, feel, I'm standing there with my arms open and I couldn't feel anything. And I was like, hang on, I put my arms a little bit higher. <laughs> Still couldn't feel it. And so I was like, what's going on? So I looked on the stage and Thought, who's leading worship? Maybe they're having a bad day. You know, I'm a worship leader. I've got grace for that. You know, we are human. Give us a break, all right? We're, you know, cut us, we'll bleed. And I'm thinking maybe there's just the worship leaders having an off morning. That wasn't the case. Amazing worship leader. Giving it their best. And I thought maybe it's a song list. Like maybe it's, you know, are they the right songs? And obviously that. And then I thought maybe, just maybe God's having the day off, which is completely fine. He does a lot. He doesn't really get a break. He's got to look after like 8 billion people. He's having the morning off. I think you can have a few mornings off if you ask me, but obviously we know that's not the case. And all this is kind of going through my head. And I'm standing there like this, kind of waiting for the seeking that, you know, the emotion and the feeling of, of God so I could give Him praise. And as I'm doing that, I look next to me. I'm on the end of the aisle and there's an aisle here and there's a lady standing here and she's got her arms raised. She's leaning in and she has tears streaming down her face. And it is undeniable that God is, is in the place and He's moving and she's having a, a tangible encounter with the presence of God. And it hit me that God was in that room right now, but he was in her aisle. So I stepped over and I, <laughs> come on, you know me better. I didn't do that. But what I did realise on that morning, just because I can't feel God doesn't mean that he's not here. We know God is Emmanuel. He's with us. We know that we can't hide, wherever we go, we can't escape his presence. And just because we can't feel it doesn't mean he's here. And I believe it's a dangerous thing if we ever seek God just for the feeling of His presence or we're going to praise God. Because I, can I tell you one thing, and this is the honest truth, the greatest encounters I've ever had with the presence and person of Jesus has been giving Him praise, coming to Him when I haven't felt like it. 
That's the greatest time. And on the, that's the other side of, you know, the breakthrough of praise. When we understand the power of our praise, and with the power of when we magnify the name of Jesus on any day, in any situation, I believe that's when we can see God just open up the doors of our lives, the things that are holding us back, that have us in chains. We just got to understand that praise is never about the way that we feel. And can I read you one of the scariest or one of the scariest scriptures that I've kind of come across in the Bible? Okay, I'm so glad you want to hear it because I'm going to read it anyway. But there's this scripture in Amos, and I, I love this scripture because it's kind of always keeps, keeps me, you know, keeping the main thing, the main thing when it comes to praising and worshiping God. Amos 5 verse 21 says, I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. I want nothing to do with your religion projects, your pretentious slogans or goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. When was the last time you sang to me? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Wow. I, and I, love, I am all about conferences and conventions and gathering around and singing, but my prayer is that our music would never be noisy ego music to Jesus. But we would understand that our praise, our singing, our worship, and we know that praise is so much more than a song. It's the life that we live and I know we all get that, but I pray that it's never about what we can get from God for us, but it's always about who He is and what we can give to Him. And that's what our lives should be about with every breath that we have, with every day that God graces us with, that we would understand that praise isn't about what we can get from God. Praise is all about what we can get, give to God and it's not based on the way that we feel. Amen, do you believe it? So if we're gonna live these lives of praise, we've gotta concentrate on what we have. We've gotta understand that praise isn't based on how we feel. And the third thing is we've got to keep our perspective. You know, I think about Paul and Silas, again, in the midnight hour, with everything that they've gone through, they were somehow able to keep their perspective. And I think in life, it's so easy for us to, to lose our perspective. I remember the first time, literally the first time I ever got on a plane and got to travel with our Hillsong United team, we, we came to Los Angeles and I was so excited because when you live in Australia, America is just like, Mecca. It's like basketball, movies, music, just everything. And I just was like, I don't know, I was just my dream to come to America. And I couldn't believe that I was able to get on a plane and come to do what I'm passionate and love. And so I was so excited. I couldn't believe it. And we literally landed that morning. And that night was our first worship night in Los Angeles. And I was just so excited. And I was leading the second song. And I was leading this song called Free. It's like a really old Hillsong United praise song. If you've been around for a little while, you may remember it. Probably don't, but um, and I was, I was pumped because I love this song and I love to dance or I love to praise God to it. And I'd sung it thousands of times, so I knew it back to front, like the back of my hand. And so I was, this was, I was so excited. I was coming to praise God, and the intro kind of starts. And I go to sing the first verse, and this is exactly what happened. I, I, I started singing, I'm like, Would you believe me if I said, da 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 da. Uh, yeah, would you believe me if I said that you da, 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 da. And honestly, I just, my mind went blank. We didn't have the blessing of the lyric screen back in those days. And I just, I could not believe, I'm like, how did this happen? And this is, I completely lost my perspective because this is what I'd done. That song finished and I was honestly thought by the time that song had finished, I was going to look to the side of stage and our manager was going to do this. And there was, I knew there was an 11 p.m. flight back to Sydney that night. I thought he would have had it basically changed my flight tickets to, to leave that night because I'd stuffed up and I would never lead worship again. I would never travel. Like, I'm like freaking out. I'm like, what are my parents? They're going to be like, it's, this is so embarrassing. Whoever has been sent home from a tour on the first night. But this is like, this is literally all going through my head as I'm leading a song. Who knows when you lead worship, your mind can do some amazing things. <laughs> But I completely lost perspective. And I think if we're going to live these kind of lives that I know God has called us to live, a, a people of praise, understanding the power of our praise and what it can do, I believe we need to keep our perspective in every season, every situation that we go through. And there's this scripture in 1 Peter 4 verse 12. It says, friends, when life gets really difficult, don't jump to the conclusion that God isn't on the job. Instead, be glad that you're in the thick of what Christ experienced. This is a spiritual refining process with glory just around the corner. I love this scripture because, can we get real for a moment? 
I love the Word of God. It doesn't, it doesn't sugarcoat the way our lives are going to go. It doesn't say, friends, if your life happens to get a little bit difficult. No, it says, friends, when life gets difficult. So we all know it's only a matter of time. It says, don't jump to the conclusion that God isn't on the job. And you know, I'm here this morning to say that it's okay if our first reaction might be to question, possibly blame God. But I want to encourage you, don't let your first reaction be your last. If we're going to live these kind of lives of praise that we were created to live, we can't just jump to the conclusion that God isn't on the job. Don't let your first reaction be your last. Then the scripture goes on to say, instead, be glad that you're in the very thick of what Christ experienced. And if I can be honest, I've meditated on the scripture and thought about like, what, are we, what does that mean? Are we supposed to like, how do we be glad when things aren't going our way? And I kind of, I think, say for example, the, the challenge or say you broke your leg. Let's just use that as an example, of, you know, something that kind of happens that we weren't expecting. I don't think when it says that we should, the Bible says we should be glad, that it means we run around going, praise God, he broke my leg, give him glory, I've got a broken leg, amen, hallelujah. I personally don't think that's the way that God's called us to live. But I also don't think he's called us to just hide it and pretend that we're not broken, pretend that it's not there. I believe the way that we are supposed to rejoice and praise God in the middle of our circumstances, maybe go, you know what, I'm not going to deny it. I have a broken leg. I didn't plan for it. I didn't want it, but I've got a broken leg. And I don't understand why, but what I do understand is that God is going to heal me. With each day, it's going to get better. It's going to get easier. Maybe I might have to take one step back to take two steps forward, but I believe that in my brokenness, that I believe the Word of God, it's the truth, and that glory is just around the corner. I don't know when I'm going to turn that corner, but I know that that corner is coming, and glory is just around that, and somehow... God is going to use this as a testimony. And hey, the other thing I realized is that when you do have a broken bone, the doctors have told me that when it heals, it actually heals so much stronger than it was before. So I understand that, you know what, I'm going to be stronger because of this and I'm going to help other people when they're walking through their brokenness. I think that's what it means that we could be glad because the Bible says we're in the, it's a spiritual refining process with glory just around the corner. And I love Romans 8, 28. It says, we know God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are are called according to His purpose for them. And so I believe that in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the trouble, in the midst of those midnight hours that we don't understand, we've got to understand, we we just need to concentrate on what we have, knowing that that's more than enough. We need to understand it doesn't matter how we feel and we also have to keep our perspective. And I believe we can live these lives of praise. And the last thing is this, and I think it's for me anyway on my personal journey, it's been the most important is we need to find the secret place. I love, I love that this is a trait that marks this house. And I love the, you know, the prayer tower outside. And I've had the privilege of going in there. And I, I love that the focus that we understand how important this is. But the truth is, we ha- if we are going to live the kind of lives of praise that God has called us to do, the incredible life, experience the freedom, not just for us, but for those around us, is we have to swap the noise for that still, small voice. I believe we can't do it without this. And um, there's a scripture in Matthew 6, verse 5 and 6 that says, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray unto your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. I love, the, the, I want to read the message translation of this same verse. It says, here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet and secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. And the focus will shift from you to God and you'll begin to sense His grace. And I believe we can't live without this. We can't live without the secret place, the the place where we hear from God and I I believe it's a quiet place where we just are with God and His Word and His presence. And I love what this scripture is saying. It says, Don't be tempted to role play before God. And I don't know for those that were here yesterday and heard the way Joel was talking about all the layers of clothes that he literally used to wear. And then that feeling that when he would go home and he'd be so sweaty from just wearing like two pairs of tracksuits in summer and playing sport. I went to school with him. I remember it was ridiculous. He literally, he wasn't kidding. He did from that time in primary school for the rest of high school. He never, ever wore shorts again. And I think that we can all, I can relate to that because whether we admit it or not, we all kind of go out to the world with certain layers or facades. You think about just common conversation. How does it go? 
How are you going? Good. What about you? Good. Great. Have a good day. You know, like we, everyone's always good. And, but the truth is, I love it when we come before God. It says that we should just come as simply and honestly as we can manage. Because you know what I love? I love that God, God sees through all our layers anyway. And you know the real you, the, the you that is under all those layers? That is the you that God loves. That God gave His only Son, Jesus, to die for us so we could experience His forgiveness and mercy and grace and His love. There's nothing more freeing and accepting and great when you can just, simply and honestly as you can manage, come before God and like His Word teaches us, it's that's when we start to sense His grace. And I believe if we are going to live these kind of lives that God has called each and every one of us to live, lives of relentless praise, unstoppable, understanding the power in our praise, when we magnify that name Jesus, not just in these four walls, as incredible as this is. I love that this, these two weeks aren't just about what happens in these two, two weeks. It's about what's going to happen tomorrow and the next day and the next week and the next month and the next year. And it's equipping us to live the way that God has called us to live. And I, I simply have come with one word this morning. And that is, I believe that we can make a decision to live the kind of lives that we're going to praise God, whether we feel it or not, whether we can see it or not, whether we understand it or not, that we can make a decision that we are going to lift up, we are going to magnify that name of Jesus. And as a result, on the other side of our praise, it's breakthrough. It's breakthrough. It's doors being opened. It's chains being broken. Amen? Amen. Come on, if you believe it, would you give God some praise right now? You know, I'd just love to pray for everyone. So if you want to make that decision, you're going to live this life of relentless, unstoppable praise. Would you stand to your feet with me? Come on, would you lift both hands in the air? Lord God, I just thank you for every single person that is in this room. Lord, I thank you that you have the most incredible plan the most incredible purpose, Lord God, that you've pathed out a lane for them, Lord God, specially, personally designed for them. And God, I pray right now that you would remind every heart, every life, every spirit that you've created in this room, Lord God, that you have created them to magnify your name. Lord God, I pray that we'd be reminded even when it doesn't make sense, even when we can't see it, even when we can't feel it, Lord God, that we wouldn't be the people that lose our perspective, We're not going to jump to conclusions that you're not here. We're not going to let our first reaction be our last. But God, we stand here today with arms raised high, saying that we're going to live lives of unstoppable praise. Lord God, that we believe that you are going to do incredible things as we go from this place, Lord God. And I believe that the fruit of our praise is freedom. It is chains being broken. Come on, if you believe it, let's give Him some praise. Amen. Amen.